everyone. We are so excited to have you join us for our first Lunch and Learn webinar with Betsy Betros. My name is Tammy Thompson. I am with Deep Roots KC, and I am delighted to share this next hour with you. Before I talk about today's topic and introduce our speakers, I want to make a few announcements. First of all, we are incredibly grateful to the Alvin L. Gottlieb Foundation and the Missouri Department of Conservation for their generous sponsorship of this webinar series. This webinar will be recorded and up on the Deep Roots website on Monday. Uh, you'll also receive an email with that link and any resources that we've mentioned during this broadcast. Today's broadcast will have many resources as this topic is so important and has so much documented about it. And it also affects every single one of us in one way or another. So watch your email and our website for those. So insects, they are critical to our ecosystem and, and we know that. They are critical to bird populations, pollination of food and other economic ventures. So why are they important and how do we protect our incredibly beneficial insects and pollinators all the while living with the human discomfort of just a few insects? So today's broadcast will be segmented into two. First, Betsy Betros will discuss the mega benefits of insects in our gardens and how we can attract all of the good ones. Then toward the end, we will assemble a panel, you being an important part of it, to discuss how to live in harmony somewhat, with mosquitoes and other biting insects without resorting to widespread insecticide use. We're, we'll talk about what works, what doesn't work, how insecticides are harming our pollinators, and maybe, just maybe, how we can convince others to avoid widespread spraying to kill one or two types of biting insects. So let's get this party started. Uh, during the program, if you have questions, please note those in the Q&A tool on Zoom and we will get to as many of those as we can. I'll be using the chat to send you links and references mentioned during the webinar. And with that, I am honored to introduce our speaker today. Betsy Betros is a famed author, entomologist, master naturalist, gifted photographer, and tireless advocate for insects. Today, Betsy will share many of the benefits of inviting insects into our gardens. And later we'll talk about how to deal with some of the very special insects that leave us itchy. But Betsy, thank you for being here and just take it away. Okay. <laughs> Hope so. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Woohoo, it's there. Okay, can you see the screen and can you hear me? It looks perfect and I can hear you just perfectly. So okay. all yours. Okay, thanks, Tammy. Okay, well, I'd like to start off with a couple quotes, and one's Rachel Carson. I suspect a lot of you are familiar with her. Her book, Silent Spring, published in 62, really was the impetus for driving the environmental movement of trying to regulate and control um, pesticides. So, and it, the balance of nature, and in this book, she's talked about ecology, which was not commonly talked about. It's a complex and precise and highly integrated system of relationships between living things, which cannot safely be ignored um, any more than the law of gravity can be defied with impunity by a man perched on the edge of a cliff. You can't deny it. And the second one is Eric Grissel. Um, his book, Insects and Gardens, I highly recommend. It's all about uh, what insects do in your garden, which is basically what I'm gonna be going over today. So perhaps by understanding what insects are and what they do, we will appreciate how they function to please us and to displease us. Insects are merely insects. After all, they have no worldly pretensions other than survival. They're not plotting to take over the world. Okay, so good bugs, bad bugs. Well, my particular presentation isn't about us versus them, good bugs, bad bugs, don't ask me questions about how to control insects. I actually garden to bring in insects, even on my tomato plants. So, um, so it's easy to love butterflies. A lot of people want to plant flowers to attract butterflies. But the first time they see a caterpillar in their garden, they go, oh my God, get the pesticide out. I don't want caterpillars. Well, caterpillars are the children of butterflies and moths. And you've got to provide the food for the kids 
or you won't have the butterflies. So, so for me, welcoming and understanding the ways of, oh, the ways of multi-legged critters in the world around us is a most wonderful way to live life. And I'm retired now, so I'm doing it full time. Well, sort of full time. <laughs> and that's not to say there aren't valid issues with some insects. Some insects can and do wreak havoc, especially non-native species like this delightful uh, Japanese beetle that uh, seems to eat everything. And the um, emerald ash borer, the larvae of which um, have uh, decimated the ash trees in almost all of Eastern North America. I know they killed dozens of ash trees on my, my property. So no natural predators. And there's also, of course, historically and still currently are the diseases spread by insects, which can be catastrophic. And those are not to, any of those are not to be taken lightly. But this show is really about appreciating and enjoying insects. Oh, I'll explain that later. Okay, so this is a fun obsession of getting close and personal with the little critters of the world, the insects my favorites. So why? Some people do ask me that. Well, they're everywhere and they're amazing and they're endlessly fascinating because uh, this is not my photo. They're endlessly fascinating. There's endless numbers to enjoy them. This is a tropical uh, plant hopper that it's uh, scutellum on the back of its back has somehow through evolution become looking like a fierce ant to potentially scare off predators because in insects are primarily chewed upon by other insects. Okay, so, but most importantly is that it can just be fun, you know, going out with friends to look for but butterflies or birds or plants or whatever, it can be fun. And who doesn't want some fun? So part two, the numbers and a super quick view of the characteristics of insects. Um, one, definitely the universe must have loved insects because there are so bleeping many of them. And you look out there and you just go, oh my gosh. I mean, there's just endless, endless, endless. And so that's why I never get tired of looking for them. Well, when it's 95 degrees out, I get a little tired, but, uh, but anyway, it's endless. And these are all local bugs here. So world, in, um, worldwide, there's some 800,000 to a million described species. And that described means that somebody has picked a single uh, representative of that species to describe it in, in literature, in the, well, published, so that other people could read it and either say yay or nay. So that's why it's a turn to a million and probably more millions left to be described and found. So while crustaceans like lobsters and the such are dominant arthropods in the marine environment, uh, the hexapods, which is six, hexa six pods of feet, including insects, rule the land. So in uh, North America, uh, north of Mexico, is in the United States and Canada, we've got over 86,000 described species of insects. So you can start as a two-year-old and never run out of bugs to find. Some say there's probably a whole lot more, and they probably are. So a little bit about characteristics. Insects don't have inside skeletons like people do. They don't have a, a, a bone structure inside that all their muscles and all are attached to. Their skeleton is on the outside and it can be uh, very hard or very soft, like a flexible, like a caterpillar. It, it just varies. Um, now, insects have insides. And when I was a kid, I thought the inside of bugs was green goo because you know you're driving along the highway and splat 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 i got all these bugs got squished there and they looked like it was green goo much to my amazement when i found out they got innards so because just like us they need to eat they need to breathe they need to digest that food relief that release that release that food move around and reproduce so that was your quick look there and now another really quick look at some, a little bit of some basic ecology concepts. And the earth is a biosphere. It's a place for life. It's the only known place in the universe that we know there is life. And so why is there life? Well, 
it's a very involved scientific, spiritually, culturally complex question. There's certainly no single answer. But despite all that, whatever one's beliefs are, science can explain the processes by which life is sustained on Earth. So it makes no question it's a fact that living organisms sustain life by processing energy and inorganic material that is non-living matter into living cells. And we look at energy and matter kind of existing in chaos until life creates biological order from chaos and we have life and we keep moving along. So biological life on earth has developed into an incredibly complex variety of plants and animals all over the place that if you had the chance to travel and go to the tropics, see a lot more. And just around the United States, there's plenty of creatures, beautiful creatures and flowers and stuff to have fun with. So we need energy and we need matter. And how do, how do we as animals or plants uh, get it so we can grow and we can function? Well, the source of energy for almost all life forms is sunlight. And no matter how long you stay in the sun, you're not gonna get, um, <laughs> you're not gonna get energy from it. You're gonna get a good burn. And as long as we've got a strong thick ozone layer, it's gonna minimize the ultraviolet rays that are coming out of the sun that could give you cancer. So, so we don't get energy that way. So it's actually by eating. And actually, hold on a sec, I got this, uh, oh, there. I got this thing that's in my way. Uh, huh. I guess I can't get rid of it. Oh, well. Um, so energy, uh, eating transfers matter and energy. That's one. Uh, okay, maybe I can get rid of it this way. Sorry, pausing just a moment. Uh, no, it doesn't tell me how to get out of that. Okay, so it's done through the food chain of who eats who, because basically that's how life is sustained is who eats who. But where did that energy originate from? Well, first I want to look at what we call air ecological pyramids and at the bottom of the pyramid are the producers. These are the green plants, green, the algae, cyanophytes, which are blue-green algae. They are the one producing their own energy through that process called photosynthesis. And then there's all the consumers above that. There's the herbivores that eat plants, green stuff, and that can be anything from a grasshopper to a moose. Uh, then you have the carnivores, and lots of carnivores. Eventually we have the top dog uh, carnivore, which humans are top dog carnivores. We're at the top of the food chain, meaning not much eats us. But in order to support in the ecosystem, one top dog carnivore, like say one bobcat out here, one coyote, you have to have a lot of green stuff to support that one top dog carnivore. So, how does all this green stuff grow? Because green stuff does grow. And maybe y'all remember photosynthesis from high school biology class, or maybe you've forgotten, so it doesn't matter either way. I'm gonna introduce just briefly to the process, the absolutely amazing process of how we get energy and matter that we are made out of. And photosynthesis is carried out in the chlorophyll plus some enzymes in plants. And basically they're taking in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they're taking in water or through the roots or even some uh, from the atmosphere. They have the green thing, green stuff called chlorophyll and some enzymes. And what happens is you see down here, I'll move this thing out of the way again, um, carbon dioxide formula is CO2 and water is H2O plus sunlight. And what happens is then chlorophyll breaks those two molecules down and re puts them back together into one molecule. And that one molecule is glucose. It's the uh, most simplest of sugars, but they have a waste product. They have a gaseous waste product, but it, we like it real well because that gaseous waste, waste product is oxygen. So what we're breathing and also plants are breathing. Plants just don't take in CO2. So, you know, we're just breathing what plants pooped out. <laughs> okay. So now that glucose, you may think glucose, oh my God, that's sugar. I hate sugar. Oh, you really need to love sugar. It's the volume of sugar we consume. But uh, glucose, some, part, some of the glucose that you take in is used to make more, more of you. So the tissue you're made out of is made out of the carbon and hydrogen that were in those inorganic molecules of water and carbon dioxide. 
those things are made into living cells. Now, granted, there's a lot more involved with that, and there's a lot more elements that are involved, but at the very base is that. Uh, another batch of the uh, glucose is used to release energy, and it's for all the functions that our bodies do, and that's a process called cellular respiration, which I'll sh show you just shortly. And then we also to store energy, because when, uh, for example, plants, plant seeds, acorns or sunflower seeds, generally are full of, they're fairly high calorie because they're full of fat, because that's storing it before when those sprout in the spring, before there's, uh, they have green petals to photosynthesize, they need to feed on the, the energy stored inside their little bodies. Oh, yep, yeah, amazing. Wow. And oh, yes. Yes, we store storing energy. OK, the second process is called cellular respiration. And this happens to be the exact opposite of photosynthesis. And this is what our body's doing 24 seven, every single cell of our body. It's taking that glucose, it's quote, burning it with oxygen, it's chemically burning, it's not, there's no flames in every one of your cells. Oh, that might be kind of cool. So the oxygen we breathe in into our lungs, our arteries pick it up, and then it's distributed to every single cell of our body nonstop. If it ever stops, the, the cells are dead and probably you're dead. But by doing that, you're breaking apart the glucose which is here, and you're spitting back out what plants started with, which was CO2, carbon dioxide, and water. So, and we're breathing out carbon dioxide now, and water comes out many different ways. And then the energy is released through the really complex systems in our uh, bodies, like the ATP and ADP, and all that stuff of how we actually get the energy. I won't go into that. So, uh, one of the things that makes plant, uh, bugs really successful is that most of them have very high biotic potential. Any organism has a biotic potential. And you think about a bug's life, mostly it's geared towards survival. And that survival needs either eat, 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 or avoiding getting eaten, or they're reproducing. So um, insects do have tremendous biotic potential. If there were no checks and balances, they could overpopulate the world in no time, but of course they would eat everything in sight and then there would be massive famine and death. So there's gotta be stuff that stops any organism from outgrowing its environment. And these are dung beetles on some really tasty horse dung. And um, I always tell people that if you're having trouble with your teenagers, just tell them they're glad, they should be glad they weren't born dung beetles because the mommies put them in dung to live. <laughs> So a, a, a way to illustrate that is we take the basic house fly and make an assumption that a female lays 120 eggs per generation and that there's seven generations in a year. So we go from 120, that you're assuming male and female equal. Okay, the next generation, if all these live, 7,200, so on and so forth, boom, boom, till you get to the fifth generation. And this is how many offspring potentially could have been uh, could occur based on just that one fly. Now, obviously you don't have 5 trillion house flies in your house. So things happen besides fly swatters. Um, there's disease, there's they get eaten. Um, well, the disease or get eaten. <laughs> uh, they simply don't live long. So anyway, there are lots of things that stop them from getting into 5 trillion flies in your house. So this one is a good example of, uh, so, the teacher here, there we go, sorry, I'm, I know my hand was in the way. He asked the question and the, the fly says, well, there's 156. Okay, what's 188 times 254? Oh, no problem, says the fly. That's 47,752. Okay, I'm gonna get you good now. 3,541 times 798. The fly readily says, oh, that's 2,825,718. And then from that, the beetle, that teacher concludes that, House flies can really multiply fast. So part four, this is the part um, where I'm talking about the roles of insects in your garden and in, basically in the ecosystem uh, to give you why they exist, why we want them in our garden. And another qu quote from Eric Grissel, and I highly recommend his book, Insects and Gardens. It actually, it goes through all the functions of insects in our gardens. And it's very readable. He's got a good dry sense of humor. 
So I, re I recommend that highly. So perhaps by understanding what insects are and what they do, we will appreciate how they function both to please us as well as displease us. Because again, insects are merely insects. They're not apt to conquer the world. And in incredibly, some people may not believe this, but at least 90% of the insect species do no harm to humans, but they are essential to the human way of life as well as the rest of the living part of the planet. So some of the roles of insects, whether it's an ecosystem or it's in your garden, um, they're scavengers, they're feeding on the dead stuff, dead, like dead vegetables, dead leaves, um, dead animals. There's predators keeping that biotic potential and uh, uh, keeping it down by eating them all. Uh, insects produce a lot of offspring because everybody wants to eat them. So they need a lot. So they have a few left over and everything's good. So then we have prey that are those that are feeding the food chain at the very bottom. And those are supporting the existence of all the other critters up the food chain and who in turn, all those critters have their own roles in the ecosystem. We also can, the insects are also can be controlled by other insects that are what are called parasitoids or, and parasites. And that's when uh, one bug invades another bug's innards or outer sides, basically eats it, kills it, and then turns into that bug rather than the first bug. If you figured out those bugs, good luck. But I'm gonna talk about more here shortly. So uh, they are vegetarians. Uh, Every part of a plant, roots up to the flowers, up to the pollen, everything, there's gonna be some bug out there that eats part of those parts. And plants and bugs go hand in hand in evolution and are necessary for each other. But, and pollinators, of course, that's the biggie. People like to think of how important it is, and it is very important because it helps feed the world, literally, and it provides for plant survival and reproduction. And also some roles are just as um, reproductive vessels. They don't feed as adults. They emerge, they find their long lost love, mate, lay eggs, and pretty much that's it. And aesthetic, I mean, one reason we do, we get interested in saving bugs or more easily little warm fuzzy creatures in the world, but bugs sometimes take a higher level of appreciation. Because again, if you're a bug, it seems like everything's out to get you because you're at the bottom of the food chain. So one of the roles is scavengers. And you can imagine if um, everything that died outside, nothing happened to it, we'd be piled up with dead animals and dead plants, dead trees, because nothing's just de keep decomposing it. So they're extremely important because they're also, by breaking down the dead plants, dead animals, you're also returning the elements that they are made out of back available for recycling through the food chain, through photosynthesis, et cetera. I say photosynthesis, not so much that, but plants are taking up other elements like sulfur and potassium, calcium, all those other good things that our bodies are made out of. So there are scavengers that feed on dead wood. And this is one of my favorite beetles. I just, I just think they're, they're just cool looking. Don't ask me why. I think that they just are. Oh, one, other, one thing to mention too, insects, all insects have antennae. You can see the, they're up there. As opposed to spiders, no spiders have antennae. So sometimes people get some stages of insects look like spiders and they aren't, just look for their antenna or ask them. <laughs> but this is a grapevine beetle. The, cat, the adult feeds on grapevine leaves, but the larvae feed on dead, dead wood of maple, hackberry, walnut, a apple, sycamore, oak, and elm species. And wood is not that high in, in, high in food value. So it can take them quite a while. It may take them several years of eating as a larva before they can actually become an adult. Uh, another one is this cool, I love this one. This is a, a reddish brown stag beetle. And I showed you in one of the earlier screens. It also, the larvae itself feeds on dead woods. The adults do feed because they don't, they don't die right away, but they'll, they like tree sap. Tree sap is real important. People think, oh, I got, the tree's got an injury. I better cut it down. I'm going, no, lots of things like that tree sap. And again, but their larvae uh, feed in rotting logs.
So scavengers will answer probably the biggest number one, and they are everywhere and huge numbers all around the globe. I think if all the ants died off, suddenly the, the world would just collapse on itself. But they come in all sorts of sizes and patterns and habits. The food they eat varies uh, with the species. Uh, some of them are predators, some are scavengers. They all have sweet teeth, sweet tooth. And I'll go into more of this shortly. The black carpenter ants, one that a lot of people are familiar with and probably despise, but you don't need to. And this is just an interesting one. This is an acorn ant. This, this particular genus of ants, they're really tiny. And some of them actually make their colonies in acorns. I'm not sure how big those colonies, they can't be too big, but that's what they do. And uh, this is an American uh, carpenter beetle, just some interesting ones. And this one on the bottom, these are called false honey ants. And you're not you're gonna get them, but I find them interesting to talk about. One spring, it's probably April, I thought, well, I'll put out some sugar bait, to see what cool things come to it. So it was, it was uh, maple syrup mixed with water. And I come outside after a while and I look, oh, geez, it's just a bunch of stupid ants. Sorry, anybody there that likes ants from forever, like if you're there, James Traeger. But then I got to realizing, well, they're all in a row. Isn't that cool? So they must be a something of interest. And, the, and they, are, oops, where'd it go? Sorry about that. I got this thing in the way. Oh, where'd it go? Oh, huh, I don't know where that one went. Okay, but they, um, they are false honey ants, but you can literally watch them when they start feeding like this one, they eat, 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 and they swell up, swell up, swell up until they're full of honey, or uh, in the case of this maple syrup. And people will also do stuff that like put dye in it, food grade dye, and then every one of these abdomens is that color, which can be entertaining. I haven't done that, but there's certainly people that have. Okay. So back to the carpenter ant, a lot of people think they're just horrible creatures. They invade our houses and we got to get rid of them. Well, no, well, in your house you do, but there's reason and how you can do that. So they don't eat wood, but they do tunnel into rotting wood. So if you've got carpenter beetle or carpenter ants in your walls or your, your any woodwork, they're there because the wood is moist. It's starting to decompose and it's the right level of mushiness that they can chew in to make their colony. So while you can spray your, those ants in the house, you better fix where they're living by re like replacing the wood. But that role is also important in forest ecology because they're expediting decomposition as they chew up all that wood and drop it on the ground. So mature colonies of these guys can live up to 15 years. And some believe they could essentially be immortal. They probably aren't because predators find them by simply adding queens. When one queen dies off, adding another queen. And a given colony can have several thousand ants. So this is a black, uh, black carpenter ant here. One way that, one characteristic they do share is they have all these yellow spiky things on the end of their abdomen. So that's characteristic. This one, I'm not sure if you can see these real clear, but those are a type of uh, plant hopper. And plant hoppers feed on, the uh, sap, the, the plant sap, and which is high in sugar, but they slurp a lot of it down, but then they have too much. So they have to get rid of the excess uh, sugar water, which comes out what we call honeydew. And ants have that sweet tooth. So these guys will tend, they will quote tend their farm uh, plant hoppers, leaf hoppers to protect them from predators because they really want that sweet stuff from their butt. So, and it, it's fascinating, you just put down some rotting fruit, how fast these ants find it and how quickly they get rid of it. Like this guy, the pulp just disappeared overnight, seems like they're quick on the scene. So they're very important on decomposition. Uh, they're gathering sweets or gathering protein from different parts of the body. There's other, like I said, there's other plant hoppers, there's aphids that do that. So a very important role in nature. So you should like your ants in your, in your garden. They do live in, they live in colonies, but usually up in trees or your house, but you can fix your problem in your house uh, and then they won't be there. And a, a given colony can have like a thousand ants, thousands of ants, but woodpeckers like them. And pileated or pileated woodpeckers, however you want to pronounce that, 
are the, are our fig. This is our big woody woodpecker. Wood, woodpecker. They're known to eat entire colonies of carpenter ants, and I think they need some ant acid afterwards. <laughs> okay, so in the spring, uh, the the they grow wings, and the females and males and males are produced, and they'll start to swarm out of their colony if it's too overgrown and they need to find some more living space. Uh, after they mate, the males die off and then a single female, which becomes the queen of a new colony, there's only one queen for the rest of the season. And for the rest of the season, they're just sterile females that are doing all of the work. Uh, and the colonies do overwinter uh, that you don't necessarily see them swarming, but they can also, because they swarm and they got wings, some people get panicky because they think the termites are invading their neighborhoods. And they're not. So this is a uh, typical termite. And the big difference between them, other than that these late, uh, wings break off, is they have they have no ab they have no uh, waste between the abdomen and the thorax. Uh, and if you're looking at close, you can see that. <laughs> but I realize not everybody looks things close. Okay, so I want to show you. Hopefully this works. I put out uh, rot old fruit, rotting fruit, to attract insects. Ants, I get lots of ants, but I get a lot of other cool stuff. So I want to show this particular group of ants. And if you got your sound on, you might want to turn it down a little bit because I did put this to music. Here we go. Hopefully. Okay. And. <laughs> Anyway, this is just wild. Look at them go. And I thought, this is unbelievable. I couldn't, you know, like they're getting some psychotic drug out of that rotten watermelon. Well, that wasn't the case. But I found out later from, let's see, got to go back. To that video show. didn't show, Betsy. Oh, no. Oh, we Bummer. can't have that. We can't have that. Just a minute. Oh, crap. Really? No, 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 no. Oh, thank you. <laughs> My Zoom camera. New share. New share. Okay, I'm getting there, guys. You are indeed. Thank you. Are you? You see me? I can see your screen. Wow, I can't. <laughs> what, what are you saying carol um, go to your zoom minimize that for a minute this whole screen yeah minimize your screen okay, hold on oh there it is thank you okay <laughs> have some backup help here um hmm i wonder why that's not showing uh let me this is really fun you got to be able to see it let me try once more so are you seeing uh, Facebook at this point in time? Oh, this is on Facebook. If you don't have Facebook, you aren't going to see it. I didn't think no, we can that. see your screen now. Oh, I can see your screen. So if you play oh. it, I think we'll see it. OK, and it is some music, which is loud. So watch these ants. I mean, this was crazy. I'd never seen ants do this. I thought maybe there was some uh, psychotic drug in the watermelon they were feeding on. Anyway, so that, that was quite amazing. So I found out from James Traeger, he's our um, expert and very big expert in ants for, in Missouri, lives on the east side of the state. And he says they're actually, uh, when they do that, they're releasing a, a sonic sound that we as humans can't hear, but it's basically saying to any other bug that wants this watermelon, stay the way, stay the heck away, because this is our watermelon. The other bugs hear it and then there they go. So I'm glad you could see that. Okay, of course, there's the little ants, like right now, that are coming into our homes. They, like I said, they got a sweet tooth. These are some of the little ants that come in our homes, like these are called acrobat ants, which uh, have this heart shaped uh, abdomen. And they occur all over the place. And they live in old carpenter ant galleys, galleries. They live in voids in our wood in our houses. And they really like honeydew. They also get protein. Uh, you can get protein from bird poop, and other insects do that as well, as well as carrion. And this one was interesting. This was a spring swarm, and they were all coming up from the ground onto this yucca plant. 
And from this yucca plant, they're simply moving to the next yucca plant over. But they were swarming, and I don't know enough about them to know what stages these all are, but uh, that's okay, just the fact that they're swarming. Then there's this one called the odorous ants. And these are definitely the little black ants that come in your house. They're called odorous because they smell like rotten coconut when they want to. I have no idea what rotten coconut smells like, and I've never smelled them releasing it, but that's why they're called odorous ants. But they're one of the little tiny ones that come in. And this is have, me and Latin names don't always mix well. I think that's how that's pronounced. A uh, little black ant, and these are little, they're like one to two millimeters, and they can really come in thick numbers in your, your kitchen particularly, because they're looking for food or sweets. And um, I've had them in my kitchen already because I've got containers of jelly and maple syrup sitting around, which they love. Oh, here's back to the ants. That's why you couldn't see them. Okay, so anyway, Oh yeah, so the rest, like I said, you aren't apt to uh, have these at your house, but these are one of the few ants that can actually forage at cold temperatures, even down to close to freezing. Most insects, they're done at that point in time, but these are actually specialized in that. So I had put this honey water bait out or maple syrup out in April. So it's still the cool season. And that's when they showed up and they're just, they were just fun to watch. And then, once it starts warming up, they go, too bad, so sad, we don't want heat anymore. So they wind up, have they got deep tunnels underground and they nest in there for the summer until it cools off and then they come back up. So, I mean, or in insects have all sorts of ways to exploit the environment around them to their advantage. Okay, another type of scavenger are the carrion feeders. So if every, anything that, any animal that died just built up in your yard, how many dead squirrels would you have? Or in this case, this is a dead raccoon. This was in one of my flower gardens and I have a sunroom and then, but then there's a window in the living room that looks out over that. And I kept seeing these vultures on it one day. And I thought, what are vultures doing up there? I'm not, I don't want vultures to nest up there. So I finally went outside and this is what they were doing. They were chewing, they were eating the rotting meat of this poor raccoon. Uh, they can eat rotten meat. You and I, if we ate rotten meat, we'd be puking up for a month, if, if not killing ourselves. So they're cleaning up all that, all that. And then there's a whole sequence of insects that will come in and feed on a carcass. And these are adult um, carrion beetles. And these are all, all found around here. And the adults really don't usually feed much on the, the carrion itself. They're usually feeding on the fly larva because you can imagine how many flies and how many eggs they've laid and how many, egg, egg lar how many larvae there are there now eating that carcass. They're just kind of interesting. This one um, actually called the burying beetle. It actually buries, you know, if, it find, if it's a little dead vole or mouse, it can actually excavate a little um, uh, spot there puts the animal in there and then it lays eggs and then they grow up eating it. <coughs> and this one though, this is called a round neck sexton beetles. And they also dig a hole and put the uh, little critter in, but they don't leave it there. They actually, they actually are really nice parents and they chew up the food from the dead or the dead mouse or whatever and mush it up and then feed it to their kids, the, the larva. So they're really good that way. And this one, you might see these little brown spots on it. Those are actually mites and they're not parasites. They're just hitching a ride. Uh, again, that's, these are all mites that feed on fly eggs. So to get little mites aren't gonna travel very far, very fast. So they hitch a ride on the uh, carrion beetles cause they are gonna be going to find some more carrion. And they are actually feeding on the eggs of flies. So it's a good thing flies actually do have high body potential because there's lots of things that eat it. And this looks like it's out of Jurassic Park. And this is a larva, I'm not sure which one, it's a larva of one of those carrion beetles. And it's the larval stage that does all the eating of the flesh. And there's different ones that, different insects that feed on the hide, there's different ones that feed on the fur, et cetera. And mentioned earlier were the dung, feed, dung feeders. Again, can you imagine the world piling up with dung? Well, actually in Australia, that's exactly what happened. When they started uh, raising cattle, horses in Australia, there were not 
uh, animals of that type in Australia. And so when they would eat and poop, eat and poop, eat and poop, nothing was eating the dung. And they're going, uh oh. So they literally imported dung beetles to Australia specifically to feed on the dung. So pretty amazing. And this is a pretty one. Um, again, I just show you some of these because they're just gorgeous. This one had come out of a, a deer dung. <laughs> and a couple of the other ones we get around here. Some actually feed on mammal poop and ugh, and others feed on uh, grass. Hold on, I'm losing my word on that. Never mind, those guys. Okay, fungus is a real important decay uh, organism. And plants or uh, wood is decayed by fungus and in a very anaerobic, very aerobic oxygen rich environment. And so when you see this part of a fungus, that's not the part that did all the work. That's actually just called the, um, a reproductive part, the part that we see above ground or above this wood, the real work is going with these little mycelium that run all through whatever they're decaying. But in that environment, uh, have been also found by bugs, and there's a group of various beetles that actually will feed on the spores, because this is a reproductive part, and mushrooms reproduce by spewing out spores. These are some of the other fungus beetles that we have. Uh, they're called pleasing, I have no idea why. They can be as little as two millimeters or as big as one and a half centimeters. And we also have uh, other types that, we have flies that are fungus feeders. That is the larval state is the fungus feeders. Like here, we got um, what are called fungus gnats uh, feeding on some of my uh, watermelon. And, oh, I'll leave that there. But one day I was out, this is some uh, swamp milkweed and it was covered with these flies. I'm like, what in the heck is that? I've never seen it since, but these are fungus gnats or dark winged fungus gnats, <laughs> excuse me. And um, they were feeding, here's their proboscis, basically their mouth part, I guess feeding on uh, nectar. Uh, I've never seen them that thick before. So there must've been some pretty good rotting stuff, fungus stuff growing in my garden someplace. And we have lady beetles. Now you might go, those aren't ladybird beetles, but they are, they're in the same family. And this one's a kidney spotted lady beetle, the 20 spotted lady beetle. And these are very tiny. You might eat probably pretty well ignore them. One and a half to three and a half millimeters. And they feed on powdery mildew. And you, we all know powdery mildew is a not uncommon problem on plants. And then the vegetarians. Well, there's lots of vegetarians, herbivores, lots and lots and lots of those. And so we have two basic mouth parts with the vegetarians. We have this uh, stink bug here, and this one feeds on green stuff. And you turn it, this is a different species, but you turn it over and you can see the, the pointy mouth part that stabs the plant to suck the juices out. Now, stink bugs also have species that are predators. And so like this is a predaceous stink bug. Uh, this one has stabbed this, um, uh, it's not a, it's not a Japanese beetle, some people think it is. It's uh, Animala is a genus. I don't think there's a common name. And then look at this little guy. This is a little nymph of a stink bug trying going after that big, uh, big caterpillar. But they are important for controlling that. So the other one are, is the um, chewing and lots of things chew. And we know grasshoppers are big chewing uh, critters. And, but Butterflies and moths are the other ones. And here is a black swallowtail caterpillar. I thought you'd be amused watching it eat this piece of fennel. They are fast. <laughs> and it just keeps feeding it, feeding it, feeding. And this is fennel, black swallowtail, the larva feed on anything in the um, uh, parsley family, carrot family, that dill, fennel, etc. Let's see. Okay, how do I get out? That's not, there we go. Okay, so some of the piercing sucking insects, there are a lot of those. And there's, uh, these are leaf called leaf hoppers and they do come in all different sizes. And they're, if you start to look at them with a camera so you can enlarge them and see how beautiful they are, because some of these are only like one or two millimeters, you can hardly see them. And the intricacy of the patterns are, are fantastic. And these all have piercing sucking mouth parts that they suck out plant juices. Rarely are they a big issue, but there's a big diverse amount of them. 
This is another type. This is called uh, plant hoppers. These are a little chunkier types, and they um, they have a lot of interesting patterns or uh, their front wings growth is kind of strange. And some others like this one, you might not be able to figure out which end is the is the right spot. And what that is, it's a leaf hopper. And I'm assuming for a potential predator, they might see what look like big jaws and there's the eyes and they might want to avoid eating that because they might get eaten. But the head is right here. And again, they're a piercing sucking insect. This particular species, the first one, that the specimen that it was uh, described from and named for was actually from Kansas, which is always kind of exciting. I'm in Kansas, so I'm always excited about Kansas, getting recognized for something positive. <laughs> And most of you've been out hiking, walking in around the place, you'll run into the spittle bugs. Bit. And this is a really ingenious method. These are the nymphs of spittle bugs, and we have different species. This is just one kind. And I have pushed the foam away to show the little nymphs, but they uh, feed on the liquid. And then somehow there's some mechanism that they can froth up that liquid and completely cover themselves to avoid predation but there are insects that are specialized specific to get to them. And Betsy, we are, we've got a couple more minutes before we wanna make sure we get to Stephen. So I just wanted to let you know, give you kind of that, that timeline. And a spittle bug was just on my, um, on my plants out front. And I was like, why is there a, like frothy spit on my, oh, on really? my native plants? <laughs> yeah, I didn't know what it was. So. I'll give, I'll get back, let you get back to I will to it. try to talk really fast now. I had it timed out last night to 40 minutes. Oh, well. Anyway, lots of piercing sucking insects that eat, that feed on plants. This is the one on uh, milkweed. We have lots of cicadas. Where, where would summer be without cicadas? Uh, they probably don't feed much, even though they got the mouth part, because they're only interested in mating. So this is our scissor grinder. And you hear them outside. There we go. Wee, wee, wee. And that's the one of our species. But that's summer. My gosh, is that summer. Weevils, lots of weevils. They have their mouths at the end of this pokey thing here. This is my favorite. It's a bean, uh, like an acorn weevil, bean weevil, because they actually can drill into uh, like an acorn and get to the meat in there. These guys are common on flowers. They're hairy, so they will pick up a lot of pollen, but they, don't, they aren't picking it up on purpose. They just do because of where they're feeding. So as a result, they are pollinators. Okay, now I got to stalk fast. Okay, there's those. Oh, this is called a head clipping weevil. And these guys, the female cuts the stem right below the flower of mostly sunflower type plants. And then inside there, uh, the both male and female will hang out for a while inside there and may eat pollen, et cetera. The eggs are laid. And then after this uh, head falls to the ground, that's when the uh, larva, the eggs hatch and the larva start their life feeding on basically the dead decaying seed head. Okay, multiple stages of katydids or longhorn grasshoppers. Those are pretty, those are pretty, okay. Now this one's the prairie tree cricket. And we get tree crickets in suburbia, but the sound, you have to listen real close because it's a very soft, but just it'll put you to sleep out if you're outside. This is, anyway, that's fun. Oops, go away. Oh, hold it. And a lot of people think insects are dirty and they aren't. Insects are very meticulous at keeping themselves clean. And this Katie did has its long antenna being pulled through its mandibles to clean it up. Lots of leaf beetles, some are pests, some are not. Uh, many of them are very specific on what they eat. And of course, you've got all the butterflies. You can read my book to find out all about that. And if you want the butterflies, you need the host plant. And there's that. Zebras, you need pawpaws, or anything in the parsley family. Okay, moths, there's beautiful moths too. These, this is a hummingbird moth. White line sphinx is very common and they hover while they feed and they get lots of pollen on them. So when they go to the next plant, they're putting pollen on the, that plant. This one is hummingbird moth. It's one of the two tomato hornworm type caterpillars. I plant tomatoes specifically to grow these because they're gorgeous moths. 
and they have this really long proboscis to feed on trumpet type flowers, but this, this does get pollen on it. This is a day flying moth. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, and here's the orange collection of moths. Here's some white ones and some other colorful ones. I'm not naming those anyway. So there's lots of predators, because uh, remember the vast control of insects is by other insects. Uh, there's, I'll just, there's robber flies that go after them in the air. There's ground beetles that chase them on the ground. There are, uh, these are ground beetle larvae that are eating food. A lot of them are just kind of brown, black ones, but there's some colorful ones like here and there. Okay. And there's the ambush, like the praying mantis going after this little skipper. Slow, 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 and <coughs> crunch, there goes the head. These are ambush bugs that sit on flowers. And you can see it's got really big muscle there. There's the bug, and it blends in really well to the plant. And then, of course, there's the blood suckers we need to be concerned with. Uh, this is the stylet. This is the blood coming up from my arm, because this was nice enough to land on my left arm so I could take pictures. And this device, provides for a stiff opening for that stylet to come out. They actually, they don't randomly uh, bite us. That's, these are the females that need iron. Uh, they actually find, find capillaries and that's where they stick their little proboscis. These are also called, these are called uh, like eye flies, uh, uh, eye gnats rather. And these were on a little wound on my arm, on my left arm too. That's a little hair there. And it was actually, I wound up watching them fill their little bodies up with my goo. Lots of assassin bugs that eat um, other insects. This one, uh, these are these little flies that are on this bee that's been caught by a wheel bug are called freeloader flies because they are specialists, especially on bees that have been caught by like a, an ambush bug and they're feeding on the bee as well as the assassin bugs. There are delightful fireflies. Uh, yes, 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 yes. These are really cool. Okay, there's some fireflies. There's lots of insects that the adults are feeding on nectar and pollen, but the larvae are actually parasitoids, whether it's Japanese beetles or it's katydids, crickets, uh, cicadas. These are the cicada killers. This is a, a, a spider wasp. And well, I probably just get through that. Mm, there's some more. Um, again, taking pictures and seeing wasps and bees on flyers, there's no issue to that. They're not gonna attack you, they don't care about you. Uh, but if you bother their nest, mama, mama might just come out and sting you. For some of them, not all of them. These mud daubers, some people don't like those because, well, there was wasps, but what those wasps are doing after they make their little mud, there's one rolling up its mud thing there, a little ball of mud, it's going off to build, it's, is that it uh, fills each of those tubes up with a, Spiders, and generally the same species in each in, in a given tube. Here's one that likes caterpillars. These are a bunch of other parasitoids, <laughs> a bunch of others. And these are just cool. These are also parasitoids, but they're a really bizarre group of, of uh, insects. These are a hyper parasite. They actually lay eggs on uh, tachinid fly, flies or Braconin and Ignomen uh, wasp because those are all parasitoids and they, these guys lay eggs on them. And there's probably something that lays eggs on them. Okay, tomato, tobacco, hornworm. If you leave them be, eventually uh, parasitoid wasps are gonna lay their eggs on them. Uh, but I, I grow them because I like them. Okay, I guess I, I'm still blabbing away. So um, some people say to control the oleander aphids on your milkweed is to just like squish them off. But you gotta make sure you've checked for the monarch eggs and you also check here, this is what's called an aphid uh, mummy. And there's little tiny wasps. This one's stinging this aphid here that they put their egg in the aphid. It eats the innards out. It, the aphid bloats up like this and they come out and they can wipe out a colony of aphids in no time. Uh, this is eggs on a stick by lacewings. This is the lacewing larva. They really love aphids. Okay, pollinators, pollinators, pollinators. A lot of these could be, you know, subjects on all their own. Bees are extremely important. There's a lot of concern about that because of the ex excessive use of pesticides. And they have um, honeybees. They have these little uh, pouches on, or pouches on, the, not pouches, little hairy parts of their leg that they pack the pollen with saliva on. 
Okay, some do it under underneath, some do these little frizzy things. Um, bumblebees are really at risk and they're very critical. Like uh, they're one of the few uh, bees that can pollinate uh, tomatoes. This is a male uh, sweat bee, it's a female. These little busy bees, they really collect, they collect pollen all over themselves on their legs. They are big pollinators. There's beetles that are pollinators. There's these little flies that are pollinators. So there's lots of things that are pollinators. These are all um, surfidae or hoverflies, which many of them mimic bees and wasps. Like this one looks like a wasp and it's not. This one is full of pollen. It's not collecting the pollen, but it's hairy. And a lot of them, the larvae do feed on aphids, not all of them. This one, and you can tell this is not, this is as big as a wasp, but wasps aren't gonna hover in front of you, but this guy will. And we'll probably skip that because that's. <laughs> so anyway, those guys there got hovering there. That's why the reason they're called hoverflies. Okay, where are we going now from there? Uh-huh. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, <laughs> maybe that's where I stop. Hold on, just a minute. Arr, arr. Betsy, no are we in a spot where we can bring Steven in? Well, I have one. Okay, yeah, let me let me just kind of finish off. Okay. Um, I am actually, I am actually in. You wanna be sure to plant flowers that bloom. There's different flowers blooming all season to attract all your bees for pollinators. Uh, there's those things that don't feed. And I've covered all this wonderful stuff, some slowly, some really fast. This is my summary thing. But last thoughts, this will tie into Stephen real well. So a lot of people say they don't like caterpillars in your garden or your trees, but think about it this way. This is a bluebird with a caterpillar in its beak. 96% of our terrestrial birds our songbirds are raise their kids on caterpillars. And you thought caterpillars turned into moths or butterflies. They actually turn into but birds, anything else that'll eat a caterpillar and lots of other birds. So they're incredible. We all need each other. And this is the one where it takes, this is a study done back east, to raise a bunch of Caroline chickadees, one batch in 16 days takes like 9,000 caterpillars. That's why spraying your trees is really deadly and it's deadly to the birds. Okay, so there we go, we'll end here. So healthy insect populations, healthy bird communities and healthy people. So learning how to manage your garden so it's more welcoming is really critical because it's not just about you, but it's about the rest of the, everything else. And we'll end there. That was a perfect ending and I'm sorry we rushed you because there's oh. so much you could dig into on each one of those uh -oh. what I loved about what you said though is um you know it's it's easy to see the benefit of a of a maybe even a caterpillar or a butterfly or those but it's really important to see the connection of of dung beetles and ants and and the and the whole of the insect population because it's so critical and when we get into the business of despising one or two and spraying for the one or two we are sacrificing the the many of the whole body of them so Stephen, why don't you join us and we'll talk we'll give you a chance to to uh give us kind of a a scenario this is Stephen van rhyne Stephen is the um, environmental manager for KC Parks, uh, an ecologist, and I would say an ardent supporter of the environment and native plants. Um, get into a get into a uh, discussion with Stephen, and and you'll likely you'll likely learn a thing or two that you didn't know for sure. But Stephen, we know you have a big job. You are the environmental manager for Casey Parks, which is an enormous job. And so with your alignment uh, and love for the nature and, and balancing that, help us help us understand how you how you approach um, dealing with health 
comfort, insects, and the parks? Because that seems like a big, a big responsibility. Well, um, there's somebody. It is. <laughs> so, uh, you know, with our parks, there's there's a, a ton of overlap between um, uh, people's health and me getting chances to go out and, into nature, even if it is just as simple as a, as you know, a patch of mowed turf with a few trees. However, there's there's solid evidence that that shows that. Uh, the greater greater species diversity actually that that effect of being out in nature is is enhanced by having greater species diversity. So um, currently at Parks and Rec, we're trying very hard to move from putting in annual non-native plants in our gardens and in, in, in our planted sites to using perennial native plants. Um, there's a lot of um, of uh, man management benefits to that. Um, one, we're not buying plants every year. Uh, once these plants are established, we won't have to water them as much. So we're getting a lot of, of benefit out of out of this as being um, a lower level of inputs from parks in, in terms of uh, our, our resources. But <clears throat> as you know, Betsy was talking about, it's amazing um, seeing that talk really re renews my my somewhat lost love of, of insects. I mean, I, I always have, but um, I'm I'm a, a ecologist and I studied insects for my uh, degree in ecology. So. Um, Betsy, I'll probably be back out um, hunting, hunting up, looking at insects again. I, I just, and this is one of the reasons why we plant native plants is that's very different from, from planting um, a lot of other gardens, you know, where people do get uh, a little freaked out when they see some herbivory happening. When you plant native plants, you get excited when you see herbivory and you're wondering what's, what's eating the stuff I, I grew to be eaten. That's a lot of reason why we're mm -hmm. out there or providing pollen. And uh, we will, um, <clears throat> it's a, uh, it's very exciting, and it, this the, looking at all the variety of insects out there, and understanding how you know the base of what is native plants. Um, you know that's, that's where a lot of this this that starts. If you want to get a greater diversity of insects in your yard, you have a greater diversity of plants available for them to feed on, and um, it's just it, it's a whole other level way of interacting with a landscape. Other than just a purely aesthetic point of view, you have this multi layers of of ways to interact with native landscapes, and one of them is just insect watching. So, um, and as it, I, I know you, one of the things you wanted me to talk about was um, um, the mosquito applications, the, the, the broad. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, I think we all see those bright signs around, and it gives me pause. Um, I, you know, I don't love to be eaten either. Um, but I, you know, it, throwing the baby out with the bathwater always scares me because I know that once I spray for one, it's gonna it's gonna damage the the rest. So you can speak so, to that. Yeah, you know the there's there's I, you know in, in looking into that there's it, there's you know some kind of, it's a little bit of a mixed bag of, of results. There there's the, you know there are some communities that spray for mosquitoes because of the public health issues to it, and in some places in in, um, in where there's malaria, it's extremely important um, to have lower in, uh, mosquito populations. However, they're they're finding now that one of the main chemicals that um, the, the pyrethroids that they're using are, uh, mosquitoes are be becoming resistant to them. Um, so it's a, it is a really issue in parts of the world where there's, where there's a, a, a malaria. You know, here in the United States, we've, we've essentially, we do have a few mosquito-borne diseases, but we, it's not a huge issue for us yet. Um, but the evidence is, is fairly clear that, that it, generally spraying for adults is, has a mixed effectiveness. Uh, unless done very carefully, and even if done very carefully, there's a great potential for um, um, non-target species being affected. Uh, so, for example, if you're spraying at the wrong time of day, mosquitoes may not even be present. Um, you know, if you got a busy company spraying, it's going to be hard to have every one of your clients get sprayed exactly at the dusk time when mosquitoes are most active. So, there's going to be spraying outside of the active zone. There's going to be um, Insects that are that are active during that time that will be um, killed. A lot of pollinators, um, any caterpillar, non-mobile, you know, not as mobile insects that are out there um, all around all day long, would still be out there at dusk and overnight to get sprayed and will, and will die. And the, the chemicals they use are not specific to mosquitoes. They are, they will kill any any insect out there. So there's a lot of potential for uh, non-target species being killed. There's a lot a lot of it's not very effective. There's mosquitoes that live up. Uh, in the trees high. So if they're spraying just low down underneath vegetation, they might be missing the Culex uh, genus that lives up because it's been tied up in trees. 
And also mosquitoes are very mobile. So, you know, you spray, it doesn't take long for mosquitoes to, to repopulate your yard from up to a mile, over a mile away. So you could, and so I mean, my, my take on it is that the, the risk involved, if you uh, looking at the uh, decreasing insect, uh, beneficial insect populations, native insects across the country, um, it, it seems to me that the risk to those populations with the gains are, um, don't really justify the use of, of these, these chemicals on our properties. There's some other things you can do. You can avoid the high mosquito times. They're usually only active around dusk and dawn. And that you can, um, on nights when there's a good steady wind, it's a good time to go out because mosquitoes are very poor flyers. They if a, didn't need much of a wind. Um, you can even just set up a, a fan next to you on your porch. And oftentimes that's all it takes to keep the mosquitoes away from you. Yeah, that's um, my go-to. Yeah, and a lot of uh, non, non-toxic uh, um, essential oils. I, I use a, a, a mix, a name brand that I buy. It has some lemongrass in it and a few other things, lavender, and it's fairly effective. And, and mosquitoes do love me. I'm, I'm, I, when I'm on the front porch with my partner, um, she's not being bitten at all. And I get bitten like crazy. If I go inside, then she starts getting bitten. So um, oh. I'm, I, I'm- Once I'm the host is like, gone. <laughs> I am certainly somebody who, who does, does suffers from that, but I would I would never uh, generally spray from the yard. The other things you can do is eliminating um, ponded small bits of ponded water. Um, if, if they're there for up to a week, if that water's there, there's enough time for mosquitoes to go from egg to adult. Um, so you know, working with your your neighbors too, um, banding together with your neighbors to to try to eliminate sources for uh, mosquitoes is a great way. And if you have a permanent body of water that that can be that you use a water garden or other thing, small water that's harder be hard to dip out or deal with, the the mosquito dunks that have the uh, BTI the bacteria thuringiensis um, bacteria in it, which is really it's really a crystal that they produce that kills the uh, mosquitoes. Pretty targeted because most of those waters have just a lot of mosquitoes, and there are some non-targets insects that will live in ponded water and uh, something you can also do if you have ponded water is to encourage the predators of mosquitoes. They're very bad swimmers. Um, so if you've got water boatmen or predaceous diving beetles, if you've got that kind of uh, per permanent water, you can start to try to encourage a, a, an ecology in there that will help reduce the total number of mosquitoes. Most mosquitoes come from small bits of, wa bits of water, tree holes, a cup, uh, uh, you know, uh, plastic cups, small, uh, old tires. Or there's also a lot of mosquitoes that come from floodwater mosquitoes. And those, those are waters that are flooded for about ephemeral ponds around rivers for about 10 days. And they're very quick to go from egg to adult. And those ponds aren't there long enough to establish um, the kind of predator species that would be in there to, to eat on them. So there's different things you can do to help remove that, um, to help reduce the number of mosquitoes around. And avoidance, wear light colored clothes, cover up more your body some not non-toxic kind of bug spray. Um, and if it's just, if you just live in one of those places, it's really bad. You can always put up um, tents, mosquito netting tents to hang out if you wanna hang out outdoors. And then when you're active walking around, just try to do the time today when mosquitoes are less active. Yeah, I, I wind up wearing long long pants and long sleeves, yeah. but I am not I am not their favorite, favorite host uh, like Thank my you. husband is though. Well, you know, I have a couple of questions and actually they are both for you. Uh, Val asks, what is the average managed, average amount of, of property managed by parks versus workers? How much is mowed versus gardens? Oh, you have a lot um, of space. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't have a really good number on, on that. Let me just say that, that we have 223 parks, most of which is not, um, um, it's mostly a lot of mowed turf. We have, we have, if you if you add up the actual space of our little gardens we've put out so far, it'd be pretty small. We are working towards reducing reducing mowing, um, and uh, you know part of that push is because it's expensive, and uh, so we're looking to reduce mowing in some spots, which would be letting the existing fescue grow a little longer and, and mow it a couple times a year, and as we get funding and grants available to do the transition, we'll transition those to. Um, mixes of uh, wildflowers and native grasses. It's a, it's certainly the case that up front, that cost is going to be higher um, in the short run, um, you know, to, to convert an acre of, of prairie to uh, or turf grass. 
But the long run management um, in places where we can use uh, prescribed fire, we will, and other types of management. I'm guessing, we, my estimate is that we can save between um, three to $500 an acre um, compared to uh, high cycles of mowing. Now, wow. it would be cheaper to not plant and just let fescue get tall and basically hay it almost like once across a year. And, we, and we, we would consider that in some spots too. It's not as environmentally friendly as native plants, but uh, definitely better than um, having a lot of uh, mowers going around. Yeah, Does that answer your question sure. uh, about this person's question? I think, you, I think you answered Val's question really well. Uh, for our participants, uh, we don't have any more in the Q&A. There may be some things in the chat, but we are a little long on time. So I will try to get those questions answered. Jahida, would you mind taking notes uh, for the questions that are in the chat for us? Uh, for our viewers, I want you to know we are going to send out some studies that, that are documented uh, on how to handle mosquitoes, the effects of, of widespread pesticide use. We're also going to note your, um, your tips and tricks, too, on how to live in harmony in your own garden uh, with mosquitoes. Uh, I think between the two of you, I mean, Betsy covered the benefits of the insects, regardless of how annoying we think some of them might be. And, and Stephen, you wrapped up perfectly the, um, the, the consequences uh, that we have if, if we are, are widespread knocking out large parts of them. Uh, I found on my own property, the more I plant, the fewer pests bother me. It's just so interesting. So the more diverse I have uh, in plants out there, uh, the less I'm bothered by uh, even chiggers, uh, chiggers and, and mosquitoes. I don't know what's out there eating them, but maybe nothing, but I know I'm out a lot. So thank you both. Before we, um, before we sign off, for those, those of you who have um, hung in with us, uh, we've lost some of you. We are giving a little prize away. It is a signed copy of Betsy's book. It's a photographic field guide to butterflies in the Kansas City region. So I'm going to show this to you. The, I want anyone who's left in the chat, identify this butterfly and we will randomly select uh, from them the winner of this and get your email. So, um, so Betsy, thank you for signing that copy. I can't believe I didn't pick up a half a dozen when I was at your house to get this one uh, because now I'm not real interested in letting it go. Um, well, I have anyway, more. I know you do and I know where you live too. Uh -huh. I know where to pick them up. So anyway, for, for those of you who have hung in there, I'm going to hang on. Those of you who want to participate in the, um, in the, uh, the prize, we would love to have you. We'd love to have you along. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and wrap up. Thank you for letting us go long for those of you still here. Um, and Betsy and Stephen, you have been tremendous. I really appreciate all that you, you do for uh, the environment, but also for us. Um, before we uh, before we go, we want to give away the prize. So we're going to wait for Jahida to give us the winner there. Uh, we would like to draw your attention to our next event, which is Native Plants at Noon. Uh, this coming month, we are going to tour Missouri Department of Conservation site called the Barrier Conservation Site in Clay County. And I'm really excited because for many of us, it's pretty close. We're going to look at a prairie there. All of our events and webinars are on our Deep Roots website at www.deeproots.org slash events. And while you're there, if you would consider making a donation, we would be grateful. Okay, Jahida, do we have a winner? Val Frankowski wins the book. Val, you are, you are a warrior and you're always on here. And so we really appreciate that. Val, please send me your, the mailing address you would like for us to ship this book to. I'm at Tammy at deeprootskc.org, but I think I can get a hold of you if not. Again, Betsy and Stephen, thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you and hearing more from both of you in the future. And thanks for hanging on with us, folks. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye -bye.